hey guys, is this working? I've never used one of these mics quite like this. It's just amazing. I don't even have to hold it or anything. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. It's really kind of always surreal to be here when you're on a stage like this, when you've uh, spent the last seven or eight years selling popsicles. You don't really think that this would ever happen. It's not really in the plans that you made, but uh, really excited to be here and meet you all. And I wanted to start, I guess, just to get a feel for the crowd. Uh, I know this is a special group, but how many of you guys um, and gals have already started or uh, a business? Anybody out there that's already started? Cool. And then how many of you guys have ideas um, not quite yet started? More. Good, good. And then uh, uh, how many people just kind of have no idea what they're, what they're doing after, after they get out of here? That's kind of what I was like uh, for, for through college and after college. And um, I'm going to get into that story and then um, a little bit more. But first, I just wanted to say hello. Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk, I think, like make entrepreneurship seem like super fun and there's no issues. But I just want to start with a caveat that it's probably... Uh, the hardest thing I've ever done. I think it's just as hard right when you start as in the middle to where I am now that I haven't really been. I'm sure there's people in this room that have been at it a lot longer than me. Uh, it doesn't really ever get easier, um, but it's, it's a whole, whole lot of fun. So I'm going to try to walk you through my, my story. Uh, one thing that I tell myself every day is that uh, these are the good old days. That's kind of a, a, a slogan within our company now. And, and what that means to me is that whether it's your uh, kind of your first day and you're trying to figure everything out and you have really no answers or you're, um, you've been in it five years or seven years in my example and I've got new headaches and new issues, um, if you kind of look at today as uh, the good old days, you'll always like in the future look back and say like, man, things were just better then. But really that's always just kind of now if you think about it that way. Uh, so I'm so grateful to be here. Uh, things are never perfect, but being up here on stage in front of you guys, pretty darn good. Um, so what's the story? King of Pops was started uh, in 2010. Um, Kate explained accurately that I was laid off from AIG, uh, but it kind of goes back before that. Uh, my oldest brother is an anthropologist. He's now up at Vanderbilt, but before he got his job there, he was, um, he was doing his field work in different areas in Latin America. And one thing that is nice when you're kind of low on funds is to have a brother that's living in another country. So every summer, basically any trip, I would just go find wherever he was and stay on his couch. It's kind of sounding like a theme, I guess. Uh, and he was an anthropologist, so he's also a great tour guide. And one of the products uh, and kind of ideas that he's introduced, introduced to us was the paleta. So the paleta is basically a popsicle, um, but the key differences are instead of like uh, artificial flavoring and food colorings, um, it's made with really good ingredients, really real ingredients, and interesting combinations. And in addition to that, it's brought to you in kind of a fun way. You see the cart in the top right. That guy's being pretty creative. Uh, but it, it kind of meets you where you are. And also, it's really popular in the farmer's market. So part of the idea I fell in love with was uh, kind of the life cycle of fruit. And if you've ever owned fruit, which I'm guessing many of you have, you know that uh, you get it, it might not be that ripe, and then it's got this kind of great period when it, tastes really good and then it gets really ripe and then it gets too ripe and you kind of throw it away. Uh, in this really ripe area, what they do, what the, the paleta makers do in Latin America is instead of letting this fruit go bad, they turn it into a, an amazing treat. Um, so it basically extends the life of fruit uh, from no good to like weeks and weeks and weeks after they make it. So that idea just kind of clicked with me. Um, I knew, that, I knew that there was a lot of great fruit here in the South, and I also knew kind of the farmer's market scene was uh, something that is a great place to start a business, first of all, but also like a good word of mouth place. And really had no idea what I was doing, which is a good theme that you're going to start to see in the next part, but uh, I just wanted to kind of give it a shot. So when I got laid off from AIG, I had offers to go back and 
work in insurance some more. There's a job in Boston that seemed kind of cool, and but it would have been insurance. Um, didn't really want to leave the South. And so I decided I was 25, um, didn't have a whole lot to lose. I had a little bit of savings. I had saved about $7,000 um, from my time working at AIG, and I just wanted to start something for, for some, in some reason, just to kind of have a story to tell, even if it didn't work out. Um, so I certainly had no plan of, like I said, ever being on a stage talking about it, but I thought maybe I could be one guy sitting in a push cart on a corner in Atlanta and uh, figure something out. So what do you do when you just kind of have an idea and no really idea how to do it? You, in my case, go to DeKalb Farmer's Market. Have you guys ever heard of DeKalb Farmer's Market? It's one of my favorite places in the city, if you've never made it. They have um, food from all over the world, uh, the freshest fruit, really, really great ingredients. I kind of went there and bought one of everything. Um, this doesn't really look like much, to, but I always show this slide just because, uh, one, I got my friend laying on the background on the couch. He's kind of just over me talking about popsicles. And then uh, I got all these ingredients and, and really no idea what I'm going to do with them. And it's just, I think, a, a good example of kind of what it oftentimes feels like when you're starting from scratch, which we definitely were. This next one doesn't really look much better. These were my first samples. Um, these are medicine cups, and then uh, I didn't have a big enough like ice tray, so this was actually a canvas that I turned over for painting, and it, it happened to fit in my freezer nicely. So this is what I used for testing product. Uh, I took it around to elementary schools, and um, really anyone that would try one and, and add them kind of tell me what they thought. So again, it doesn't look like much here, but uh, it was the start of something. Uh, I got laid off like in September, October, and so not a great time to start a popsicle business. I started really thinking about marketing. Uh, a lot of you guys do that, and I didn't really have any ideas, but um, I, I have a friend that is a, an amazing painter, and one thing I would definitely recommend as you're starting a business is uh, your friends and your family are kind of your number one assets. Uh, take full advantage of them. But uh, this is my friend Chris. We, we spent um, basically most of February on this scaffolding painting uh, this mural. And people were pretty confused by it. Uh, they didn't really understand what King of Pops was, but we were pretty friendly and they kept coming up and asking us like uh, what we were doing, first of all. And then they kind of thought it was a joke. But uh, we finished this in the middle of February and... For some reason, this moment kind of made things begin to start to feel real to me. And I remember in that moment saying, um, I hadn't really invested that much in it. I obviously had this painting that we did, but on April 1st, kind of no matter what happens, um, I'm going to try to sell a popsicle. Because one of the things that can oftentimes happen when you're starting a business is you try to perfect and perfect and perfect and have the absolute perfect everything figured out before you start, um, but in reality, you kind of can't ever figure everything out, and um, if you did get like even the best model in the world put out there, once you release it to the real world, there's going to be shifts and changes that you need to make, and the more stuck and committed you are to your exact vision, um, you'll be doing yourself a bit of a disservice, because there's going to be changes that you're going to have to make um, and in my case, those happened pretty quickly. I had planned on kind of having a little ice cream shop, except we'd be selling pops, uh, right next to this mural. And it was about the size of this stage. It was like kind of cool, kind of cute. Uh, and I found out about, I had my lease signed. I had about a month and a half to build out the space, which I wasn't trying to do this too much, so it would be pretty easy. I was going to do most of it myself. Um, we found out fairly quickly on that we needed a grease trap. And grease trap, I was like, we're making popsicles, we're not cooking anything. Did not anticipate that. So the grease trap was going to cost like 15 to 20 grand. Like I said before, I had about 7 grand. These weren't really working out. Uh, so what happened, I had set this April 1st deadline for myself, and I was committed to keeping that deadline. So I thought, hey, what could I do? Um, you guys saw the slide a few ago, the, the, the guy pushing the push cart with the cooler on top of it. I was like, that guy seemed great. 
I'll just try to replicate what he was doing. Um, I found a shared kitchen that was down the street. Um, they were, they luckily had a few uh, hours available, and so I ended up starting there instead of this shop. Um, this is me on that first day um, in April of 2010. Uh, this photo I got from Yelp, but you can tell I don't quite have everything figured out. Um, I'm standing, I'm sitting behind that, uh, it looks like I'm waiting for a phone call, but really I'm standing, I'm sitting behind this pole because there's a small amount of shade there to keep me slightly cooler. Uh, chalkboard looks pretty questionable. Um, umbrella, I don't know, that, I don't know if that's doing much good. And then most importantly for you marketing majors, um, I didn't even have the correct brand on my cart. This says La Constanidad, which was the used push cart that I could find in time to start. So I did one thing good that day, which was got out there and started talking to people and trying to sell the product. And I really learned a lot from that. And where I had planned on having a, a, a brick and mortar store that was about this size, by having this cart on wheels, I was literally able to go everywhere in the city. So our model very quickly changed from one spot to um, events. So this, for, week, for example, this weekend we were at Music Midtown. Uh, we go to Bonnaroo. We're, at, we're rolling carts around at uh, Mercedes-Benz Stadium and SunTrust. And all of this stuff wouldn't have been possible if we had kind of gone with the standard brick and, brick and mortar model, which was the original plan. All of this is to say that at the end of the day, um, this is something that has taken me seven years to kind of come to terms with, and I still like sitting in front of you today, like I still feel kind of uncomfortable with it because uh, we're all just kind of insecure people, but uh, most people, aka everybody, don't know what they're doing. So there are people that are experts in stuff. Uh, they don't wake up in the morning just completely certain uh, in, with no questions in their mind. Um, and when you talk to somebody, uh, you need to remember that person has a million things going on in their head. Uh, they were going to sleep the night before worrying about tons of different stuff. They're insecure. Um, and they have a lot of things that they're trying to figure out too. So this has been something that's been really helpful for me as a young entrepreneur and as I get into kind of been doing it for a while now. Uh, I think it's an important thing to share. Um, when you're sitting at the board table with executives like from Whole Foods or uh, the Atlanta Hawks, all these people have their own things going on in their head and they really just kind of want to get to know what you're doing and there's nothing particularly special or not special, everyone's special, but there's nothing particularly like amazing that you can't like be on that level is what I'm trying to say. So eventually, you saw our first cart. Um, we eventually figured a few things out. I don't think that this looks like particularly amazing, but this is my brother, Nick. Um, he started the business with me. Uh, I started, and he, he was a lawyer at the time, so a little bit riskier to quit his job. When we had a little bit of momentum, he jumped in full time. He was one of those family members that I was saying, like, definitely utilize completely. He worked nights and weekends and everything, but... Uh, you can see we got our carts branded, finally. Uh, we got an umbrella that uh, wasn't like significantly better, but at least is better. A funny story about the umbrella you th it is much like the cart. Like you think all these things are like these grand marketing plans that were written out uh, months and months in advance. What really happened is that green umbrella that you saw was obviously too small, and we went to Walmart and they had this rainbow umbrella. So now the rainbow umbrella, we've, we've probably bought a couple thousand of them by now because they're not the most durable, but we put them on top of every cart, and it's certainly kind of one of the things our brand is known for. Um, you can see here, uh, this is the very beginning of us starting to figure things out, and once we thought we had this figured out, we wanted to kind of expand, and uh, expansion for us came in a lot of different ways. Um, one thing that we wanted to do as we expanded was to make sure we were being thoughtful about it. So a lot of people have a goal of just absolute world domination. And with popsicles, that's an easy thing. I mean, sometimes I like to like fantasize about selling pops in Paris or something, but for us, we wanna sell our product in the South 
uh, for a couple of reasons. The first is we want to be a local food influencer. So that means buying from all the local farms we can. And, and in order to do that well, you really have to have relationships. It takes a lot of work um, to source things well. After that, we kind of wanted to know all of our employees. Um, I want to know like the good things and the bad things that are going on with folks because that's for me kind of the fun part of all of it. Uh, that said, while we wanted to kind of stay within the south and you can see these are the seven, we're in seven cities right now. Um, we also are pretty, we did have kind of big dreams and so some of the stuff we wanted to do instead of just like getting bigger and going to California and New York, which we've had a lot of offers to do, we kind of wanted to go deeper into our community. So. Uh, one of the first things we did was um, start a company called Tree Elves. You'd kind of think, that doesn't make sense. Uh, you sell popsicles. Why would you have a company called Tree Elves that sells Christmas trees? Um, well, we don't sell that many popsicles in December. And so we had all these folks that kind of needed some jobs. And uh, we had trucks. And so this was, this was the business we came up with. And... Um, Last year, I think we sold about 3,000 trees. This year, we're hoping to sell more. But this is kind of an example of the tree elves experience. Uh, get a couple of folks that are used to selling popsicles, put them in an elf outfit, and send them out to kind of knock on people's doors. And it is amazing how much kids love this. And um, it's a lot of fun to kind of share joy in a different way. So that's one of the things we did uh, to continue to grow. Another we did, thing we did was we started a farm. So four, three years ago, we started King of Crops, which is our own farm. Um, we do a lot of, take a lot of field trips out there to kind of teach people about sustainable farming. We also grow a lot of our own produce um, and just kind of have a lot of events out there. Uh, in the same vein out there, just this year, we started a company creatively called King of Compost. Uh, they compost and... Uh, we just signed a couple contracts with um, businesses the size of like the Hyatt and uh, the World Congress Center where we'll pick up their food waste, take it out to our farm and compost it. Um, one of the things that we do, we think better than the other composting operations, which are much of the time pretty far down in South Georgia is uh, we're closer. So there's not as much of a transportation cost. And we are also, um, putting the inputs into our soil to make it specifically designed for farmers and community gardeners. So we have a product that's, that's really perfect for them. Um, we also started a distribution company, kind of rambling on at this point to distribute our own product because the, the big, the big uh, Cisco's and GFI's of the world kind of weren't taking care of our product in the way that we imagined. Um, so as things grow and grow and grow, we kind of have continued to get creative and try to think of ways that we can expand our business in, in kind of our own way. Um, and as you add more and more people into your team, I guess, you, you, you have to think about culture and uh, how, can, how can we make sure that the people that you meet, like Ray, who you'll meet later today when you're getting your pop, uh, are just as amazing as our first couple employees that met thousands of people and uh, kind of built the business into what it is. And, and, and the way you do that is work on your culture. And business books obviously talk for days about co what culture is and how to make a great culture. Um, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit, but uh, what the heck is culture? Uh, to me, it's just people sharing a love in what you're doing um, and them taking that on for themselves. And the way that you create that is engage each person in the business in any way that you can. So whether they have something they're personally passionate about that you can weave into your business um, or whether you just ask them to get involved in something that you knew you, you think would, would engage them. So um, this oftentimes uh, people kind of wonder how we got to our culture. This is a video that I, I think kind of begins to explain what you do and you're kind of bored in the winter um, trying to figure out uh, what to do next. And this is, this, is, this is a little bit about our culture. So I don't, I don't know if it'll play, but maybe it will. <laughs> a 
What do you think, guys? Uh, no sound. Well, it's a really, this is a popular internet meme that happened uh, where it kind of missed it, but uh, so basically we got pretty bored one winter day in, in, in this uh, Harlem Shake thing that happened like four years ago, which was a terrible internet meme. Uh, we just had to participate in it, and, and, and that's when we figured out what, that's kind of the day that we figured out like tree elves was going to need to be a thing because we just had a little bit too much time on our hands. Um, at the end of the day, for us, culture is very little about uh, what you say you're going to do and very much about what you actually do. So it's easy for me to get up here and talk about culture, but um, what our culture really is, is is what King of Pops, whether you're seeing it for the first time today or whether you've known about us for a few years, it's kind of what that represents for you. Nice silent replay. I'm sure you guys could not look at me while that is going on. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, our goal is to not just exist. So we want to continue to make things interesting and we do that by adding new businesses. Um, man. Uh, and, and doing all kinds of of different things throughout the community. And, and we do that through our company's purpose, which if any of you guys have not um, kind of gone to a quiet space with, with the people that are important to you and your company and tried to work on a company purpose, I would highly recommend doing that. Um, we did this about five years ago and it's made a really big difference um, because like I said, world domination of popsicles was not our ultimate goal. Um, and we tried to figure out, like, well, then why are we really doing this? Uh, and, and we were going through the process. We host a pretty big yoga event um, that has kind of grown over the, over the years. It started out with just an employee benefit that maybe five to ten people would go to and has now grown to something that maybe at its peak seven or eight hundred people go to every week. Um, and at the end of that, you... At the end of uh, yoga class, you typically go into like the laying down state, which um, I think is called Shavasana, but now I'm like completely losing it because I'm up here on stage. Anyway, you're basically laying down with your eyes closed, and I had this moment of sharing with seven or 800 people that live right around me uh, this amazing class that we had put on, and it kind of clicked that that was something that was more important to me than anything else, and so after kind of going back to our group and talking about it, uh, they kind of agreed in their own way that our purpose was to create these unexpected moments of happiness. Um, so we do that through popsicles. We think we make the world's best popsicles, so you'll get to try one later. And we're always working on improving those, but also just being out there in the community. Um, so like I was saying, here is the first, first example. These are some of our Halloween flavors that kind of getting to be near Halloween, so I'm, I'm marketing ahead of time. Uh, but we put a lot of care into making them and also into the ingredients, like I said, that we're sourcing before. And, and when you taste them, they should taste really, really good. Um, almost as important as the person, as the popsicle, is the person selling the popsicle. So this is German. Uh, he like many of our slingers, will either give you some sage life advice or maybe do a magic trick or really whatever they might feel like doing that day when you walk up to, to hopefully make your day a little bit better and put a smile on your face. That's kind of the second way we try to do it. And then the third way are these like big events. So we do everything from a run club. We host a movie night out at our farm where like the tractor holds up the screen and uh, we have field trips, and we go to the Boys and Girls Club, and we do all these things literally every week um, to try to make people smile. And this next one is just a picture of that yoga event that I was talking about where all of this kind of clicked in our, in our heads for the first time um, from above. So I was one of the people out there kind of sharing this, what I think was an unexpected moment of happiness with, with several hundred people um, the sun was kind of setting behind us and the Atlanta skyline was there and it's just, I've been to maybe 50 of the classes at this point, but that, that, that one particular one still kind of resonates in my mind. It's a feeling that I, I kind of will always remember. Um, so 
I have a video that I'm going to play next, which is the second video, and uh, I think it hopefully will just kind of reiterate what I've been trying to say about this idea that we're all figuring things out together, and uh, you shouldn't feel any bit of, you should feel the fear. The fear is good. Lean into the fear, but uh, don't think that that's ever a reason to not do something. Um, so I'm going to show this video. Uh, it's a couple minutes long, and then uh, I have a couple more things to say, and then I'd love to answer questions if we have time. I'm not sure exactly how we're doing on time. thinking about an idea or have something that you might want to do to think about the worst case uh, and what the worst thing is that could happen. But you usually don't think about what the best case is and oftentimes you can't even imagine what the best case would be because when we started, there's no way I would have imagined that we would have bought a farm, that we would have had all this excitement around something. It's such a simple idea. One of the hardest parts for me when I was working in corporate America was just not feeling connected to my work. They went from kind of sipping rum on the beach, talking about it, to four years later, um, decided to go and buy this popsicle machine and start freezing them and seeing what people thought. Literally 20 hour days during the peak of the season. But after a few months of success, it was either like, you're already working here a lot, you wanna quit that secure uh, job. I was a prosecutor at the time, so I was putting people in jail every day. So I went from putting people in jail to putting smiles on faces. And it's just like such a change of, of attitude, of, of sense of purpose. And on any given Saturday, you could find 100 people standing around eating popsicles. And to bring the community together, see people re-engage, was a really special thing for us. And that's what really made us think about what else can we do. We started looking for a farm and kind of went for it. I mean, we knew from the beginning that it wasn't going to be a money maker in the same way that a, that a pop company can be. We spent all this time planting stuff just for nothing to happen with it, or the deer to come in and eat all the strawberry plants before any strawberries came. So it's been a lot of tough times, but this year we've been able to see kind of what's going to really happen out here, and uh, it's exciting. People loved it. People loved the idea of a, a farm-to-pop-like concept. We can say, we put that on your table. We know where it's been from the time that it came out of the ground until the time you're eating it. It was more just this idea of something that felt really good, something that would be fun to share both with the employees, the community, and, and Nick and I to come out and have a, a fun project to be working on. Living the life that I want to live is all about taking a risk and doing something that I really believe in, truly want to do. So our original idea, which is just, let's do something different, I'd say it's kind of worked. Cool, so I've got kind of one more example um, to, to, I think, wrap things up. And one of the things that I really like in this video is this idea that uh, usually what you do when you decide if you're going to take a risk or, or what some people do is they think what could go wrong or what is the worst that could happen um, and we really 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 don't even have the capacity to think of what is the best thing that could happen um, just kind of repeating the video at this point but I, I literally never would have imagined that single simple idea like selling pops could could be something that first of all people would want to hear about um, but but could be a career and, and now it really is so on a smaller scale uh, we, we purchased a building uh, about a year ago it's been a long construction process but it's got one of those walls that's on a really busy street that kind of gets tagged every day and, and I've talked to a lot of business owners in the business association and they're like, man, I just paint over that wall every day. And then the very next day, it's painted back over with, with, uh, with graffiti or a tag. Um, so we were thinking about this and um, 
we were, we're kind of don't have a whole lot to, to lose. And so um, this is the building that we, is it going to work? Oh, that's the building. Uh, so we purchased this building, and it was just blank, obviously, but we wrote on it, uh, Dear Atlanta Street Artists, please consider popsicle inspiration when tagging this magnificent wall. And we, we painted this, uh, this rainbow on it, which the rainbow umbrella and all this stuff, which I told you was just kind of an accidental uh, part of our company uh, that's worked out really well. Um, and we, uh, I've, I have a lot of friends in the community, and they were all calling me like, man, graffiti artists don't play by any rules. They're going to they're gonna make your wall look crazy and do all this bad stuff. Uh, we woke up the next day. There was like one or two uh, people that had painted like popsicles, and they were nice. And I was like, man, that lasted for a day. That's cool. And I took a bunch of pictures of it. And every day it kind of just more and more and more people kept doing it, and no one did the bad thing. Um, so this is kind of what it looked like. I think this is about a week ago. But people kept just painting different popsicles and their own iteration on there. And this is something that I certainly never could have imagined. And it was a super simple idea. Um, but now we have this completely unique wall that if we had gotten all these artists together to paint this, never would have come up with this. Um, I think it's a good example kind of of putting yourself out there and, and letting good things happen to you and, and sometimes not worrying so much about the bad things. And that's all I got, but I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any, or if that's okay, Ruben, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. How do you contribute all this kind of contribution to the uh, community of people who saw this? Uh, so he asked, how do you, what do you contribute to the community, I guess? The, uh, how much do you How much? Well, yeah, that, that's a good question. I would say pretty much everything is just, community support. So for me, one lesson that I learned that I think is very applicable to that is uh, the power of individual conversations. We get really caught up in social media and having like uh, the correct Facebook ads, but that first corner that you saw the picture of, um, I talked to, for three years I sat there and I talked to the, the neighbors, the people that were coming there, and I literally saw the power of those conversations. So people that you don't really, you don't necessarily ask what they do, but they come up and you shake their hand and, hey, I'm Kevin, I live down the street. Um, and you talk about the Braves or you talk about something and then six months or nine months later, you'll be like, yeah, Kevin told Susan who then did this and they're a banker and they want to do a 400 popsicle catering or uh, I actually know the person at Whole Foods and they're, they're now interested in you getting in. So that's the power of community First of all, like it's everything for sure. Um, without, in a business like I run especially, but without the community support, you don't really have much of a business. Uh, but in addition to that, I think one thing that is a good takeaway is just the power of a conversation. It seems like with um, how prevalent social media and, and how powerful those tools can be that we kind of forget that shaking someone's hand and talking to them is also something that is going to spread and if, if you make an impact on them, they're going to be talking to dozens and dozens of people about your conversation as well, and it has a, a, a similar opportunity to make change. In the back. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, this is my first time talking about it on stage. So we had a... Um, we had an FDA issue in our Charleston kitchen. Um, basically, uh, some of the checklists weren't getting checked off when it comes to cleanliness. And we had to make a really hard decision uh, to change our, our model. We had always been making the pops in each of the seven cities, but we didn't have, um, we didn't, we had just kind of had, I'll call it hungry go-getters as our staff. Um, and so the scale that we're at now, we probably make 85 to 90 percent of our pops in Atlanta, but it was important to still be making them in those cities. We didn't have the staff in place to be able to uh, keep everything to the standards that they need to be kept for. 
So obviously, we've got a lot of good press. That's much of the reason why I'm up here on stage. Um, we don't have a lot of experience with bad press. So this was an example of bad press, a uh, story that started in Charleston. Um, we kind of faced head on and we talked about the issue. Um, we talked about where we had fallen short and where we had kind of been a disappointment. And we also talked about what we were gonna do to move forward instead of, I guess, hiding from our mistake and, um, and running from it. But as far as transparency, I mean, I think that has always been our strategy, um, both in the good and the bad. Uh, luckily, there hasn't been a lot of bad, and we're, we've put kind of, we're putting things in place to make sure in that particular area that'll never happen again. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that's a really good point. Um, and you can also just see it in the social media content. I, just being authentic and, and letting people kind of go along on this journey with you is, is really important. So. Like she said, the people that supported us actually, that was like one of our more commented on in a positive way, a way posts, but it was like something that kept me up at night for two weeks, basically. Um, so when you're building your culture and when you're having all these conversations and you're doing all these great things for the community, I think that's kind of the work you're putting in and the social equity you're putting in for when you do make a mistake and when you do stumble so those people can, can hopefully lift you up. Does that kind of answer what you're, yeah, 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 but good question. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, I learned a whole lot. I, I would never say anything I did, so I was a journalism major um, at the University of Georgia. Uh, I went to Idaho and worked at a newspaper for about a year, and uh, was doing a little bit too much skiing at Jackson Hole for the salary that I was receiving, was not lining up. And then I got a good job at AIG, uh, my brother got me. What I learned at AIG that has definitely helped me is just how to kind of have a professional relationship, uh, how to write an email in a way that is, is kind of like courteous and you can kind of do it in your own way, how to, how to show up for work and, and deal with people that might not be looking at the world in the exact same way as you, but you need to kind of interact with professionally. Um, and then I just learned a lot about kind of the, the technical stuff. Like I was an analyst, so I personally learned a lot about um, Excel and Access and a lot of the tools that you can use, which I find to be a, a pretty big advantage now um, as I'm kind of going through Popsicle stuff, which may not seem as related to that, but at the end of the day, kind of like running a business is running a business no matter what your widget is. Any other questions? Yes, sir. How many, uh, popsicles? Yeah, so he asked how many popsicles do you sell a month? Uh, so if September's a good month for us, uh, we'll probably sell maybe like 250, 300,000, 400,000 if we have a good month. And, but then when you kind of look at our tree elves months, we're selling maybe like uh, three or 4,000. So that's pretty big, pretty big up and down. Um, but yeah, it's a, that, that's one of the big challenges because we've got this really amazing staff that I'm committed to figuring out ways to kind of take care of, but uh, you have this gap where we don't have revenue. So we have to either work hard enough in the on season to, to pay through that, which we, we kind of try to do, or you can kind of figure out some other creative businesses in the winter. We also have, uh, just to talk on that for one second more, for the last year, we kind of started it, and this year we're really rolling it out. Um, if you or your friends are ever looking for a good summer job while you're starting your own business, uh, we have a surf break. So from January 15th to February 15th, you get a month off, and we kind of pay for that month off because there's just not a whole lot of work to do. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. What is your, uh, what is your daily process of actually finding new customers? So we have... I've said this several times, so many seasonal people. So on our last payroll, we had about 220 people. Uh, Full-time equivalents, that's probably about 80 or 90. Um, what was the other part of the question? Uh, what do you do? Yeah, that's, that's the struggle. So uh, you can hear this from a lot of people, and you probably will, but definitely the amount of time that you take to first, I think, source people before you even interview them, just like get a really, really big candidate pool is something that people don't often put the work into. It's just, 
vitally important. And then the interview process, um, it, it, just finding the right people, starting with who, is, is, is really, really important. And that, that's from uh, vendors to production folks all the way up to if we're hiring a new GM. Um, you really want to spend, and it's painful sometimes because you just are like, we need this space filled. We need to hire someone right now. And we've, we've, we've run through sometimes not having enough people because of that. But we, spend, we try to spend the time to, to really make sure we get the right person.